FM2 News begins now. It's been a busy news week in Spokane and the rest of the Inland Northwest. Thank you for joining us here on Krem2 Plus for Week in Review. I'm Tim Pham. Here now is a look at some of the biggest news stories from this past week. Right now, Empire Health Foundation is focusing on two outcomes, closing the camp, but also ensuring there are sufficient housing options for the people still living there. Empire Health's president told C Spokane City Council what it'll take to see it through. The latest aerial images from WashDOT show a continually shrinking homeless encampment on its property. Just look at the difference of this week compared to November last year. But there are still steps ahead to completely close up the camp. We got to work together on this issue. Zeke Smith is spearheading Empire Health Foundation's work to get this done. Right now, 124 people are still living at the camp, but Smith says a recent needs assessment revealed some of those individuals don't qualify to stay at local shelters. Some of the individuals have intensive uh, substance use issues that preclude them from uh, being able to participate at the shelters. Uh, some of them have other kinds of medical uh, or mental health needs. He says it's important for community partners to consider this challenge. That's because they'll need to determine what other housing options will best serve those individuals. If we have to wait until we've figured out together how to build out those kinds of options, um, then we're going to have folks at the camp for a long time. Empire Health is under a $3.5 million contract with the state to provide its services at the encampment. Smith says as of December last year, the foundation spent $1.2 million of that contract. That will increase because the first few months it was a bit of a ramp up in cost. In addition to transitioning the remaining people out of the camp, the next steps include making arrangements for the last of the RVs and vehicles, long-term investments in housing and shelter options, and finally removing the fence and temporary structures at the camp. Empire Health's presentation comes about a week after Council President Brian Beggs and a few other council members gathered at the encampment to acknowledge the significant progress by community partners. Amanda Rowley, Krem2 News. This project has been at the center of back and forth tensions between Catholic charities and some people in the West Hills neighborhood. Now those tensions have turned into cease and desist letters on behalf of Catholic charities. Sarah Hunter feels at home in Spokane. So I've lived in Spokane 32 years. This is my home. So when the Catalyst Project moved into the place she calls home, she felt the need to vocalize her concerns, which she did with other neighbors back in December 2022. But now she's facing a legal notice from Catholic Charities saying her stalking and harassment must stop. They're accusing me of lurking and stalking. Stalking's a felony um, and intimidating their employees at work. None of that, I mean, if that's not me and I absolutely did not do that. In a cease and desist letter, Catholic Charities claims Hunter has spent substantial periods parked outside the Catalyst Project and had increasing hostile and aggressive interactions with staff. Hunter says she's only been to the building twice. That's why she says the claims in the letter aren't true. You're intimidating me and my family and we work hard in this community and we want to help people. But to be treated like the way that we've treated from the start of this project till now, it's appalling. It saddens me. CEO of Catholic Charities Rob McCann says in his 23 years of working with the organization, he has never seen behavior like this or sent a cease and desist letter to a neighbor. McCann shared a statement on behalf of Catholic Charities saying in part, quote, the behavior we experience has become a threat to basic health and safety, end quote. The statement goes on to call harassers and stalkers a small group of deeply wounded and hurting individuals who we will continue to pray might have a transformation of heart. Hunter says while she disagrees with the project, she doesn't disagree with the need to support those experiencing homelessness. I want to help the homeless. I just think that there's a better way to do it and a better use of resources. But even with this in mind, these letters show a continuous strain in the West Hills community. A strain the West Hills Neighborhood Council says they hope to mend so we can all feel proud of the place we call home. McCann says he believes Catholic Charities has expressed their interest in a good neighbor agreement with the West Hills Neighborhood Council. However, the council chair has told me that they haven't had much response back from Catholic Charities when reaching out about a good neighbor agreement. Their last interaction was December of 2022. In Spokane, Janelle Finch, Crem2 News. 
somewhere in eastern Pennsylvania, Brian Koberger spent his teenage years and most of his adult life here. That includes stints at two local colleges, including DeSales. Now police and prosecutors in this area want to know what he was up to all those years and are digging into their cold case files. Just outside the open wilderness and resort towns of the Pocono Mountains lies a neighborhood called the Birches. It's just a very quiet community. These are the streets an accused killer once roamed as a teenager. I've definitely seen it on TV, who hasn't? Now, Lynn Klein and others in the Pennsylvania communities where Brian Koberger lived until last year want to know if he could have committed any crimes before he was charged with the murders at the University of Idaho. Because anybody or any family that's been harmed or done wrong to deserves to know the truth. It isn't just citizens. Police and prosecutors have asked the same question. Your natural reaction is to start wondering, OK, is this guy wanted? Uh, is his name out there? Uh, did he do anything here in Northampton County? Terry Houck. Terrence Houck is district attorney of Northampton County and leads an office of more than 20 prosecutors and a half dozen detectives. It's here at Northampton Community College where Brian Koberger took his first courses in higher education, graduating here in 2018. After Koberger's arrest for the Idaho murders, Northampton County's district attorney ordered a review of unsolved cases in his county. We have a, a crime information center that, that compiles information of people's description, uh, size, weight, height, method of operation, things of that nature. Obviously, you wonder whether or not there was any criminality that he uh, committed here in Lehigh County or in the environs. Jim Martin, district attorney of the neighboring county, Lehigh, also ordered a review of unsolved cases. Lehigh County is home to DeSales University, which Koberger attended after Northampton Community College. He spent four years here studying criminal justice. Ryan Koberger. Earning a master's degree last summer. What does law enforcement do given that he did spend time here? Well, we have a resource here called the Regional uh, in Intelligence and Investigation Center. It's the, the first thing I did was I asked that, uh, I asked the, the director of the RIC, as we call it, um, to see if we had any contact with Mr. Cope. A data search of more than six million police incident reports in Pennsylvania turned up only one record with Koberger's name. He called police from this bike trail one night to report that his car was locked behind a park gate. There was a response from him thanking the police and apologizing for the inconvenience. The district attorney in Monroe County, Pennsylvania, where Koberger grew up and where a SWAT team arrested him on December 30th, did not respond to our questions. But in Northampton and Lehigh counties, both district attorneys say their investigations have found no links to Koberger and any unsolved cases. So we have no unsolved homicides sides that in any way meet the mo modus operandi of, of this event out in uh, Idaho. There has nothing been brought to my attention. Uh, in fact, nothing with respect to Koberger has come, come about in our investigations of cold cases or unsolved cases to this point. And that should be some relief to a community that's been stunned and saddened by the murders of four college students 2,500 miles away. It's a little close to home. You just don't expect it. So prosecutors say the bottom line is there's no evidence that Koberger committed any crimes here in Pennsylvania. In Center Valley, Pennsylvania, I'm Chris Ingalls, Krem 2 News. It's a long way away, but this part of eastern Pennsylvania feels a deep connection with the Idaho College murders. That's because the suspect, Brian Koberger, spent his teenage years here and most of his adult life before he moved to Washington State last summer. In December, people here were hit by a fact as cold and hard as steel, the once towering industry that fueled this part of Pennsylvania. One of their own was charged in a mass murder 2,500 miles away. So I looked it up, I typed, you know, Idaho murders, and then, like, holy crap, that's Brian. Uh, you know, that's, that's Brian, I know, I know Brian, you know. That's wild to me. It's a shock, you know, seeing someone you, you, you've known on TV. Jack Bayless met Brian Koberger in eighth grade. 
when the two of them ran with a group of boys in this neighborhood near Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. I want to say he wanted to be a cop since he was younger. What kind of teenager was he? He was pretty normal. Um, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was definitely heavier set, and uh, that, that caused issues in school, um, apparently. But in high school, dramatic changes washed over Koberger, according to several friends, including Bayless. I believe it was the weight loss first. Weight loss first, and I was, you know, I want to say 14 to maybe 16, in between there, was the, the big weight loss. I could be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was. And then it was the drugs. How did he get started in drugs? He got in drugs um, via um, uh, an acquaintance of his. It was, it was definitely heroin. It was pretty darnly. Bayless doesn't know exactly when Koberger got clean. Last I saw him, he was, he was pretty lucid. But the two reconnected after Koberger enrolled at DeSales University in Center Valley, right around the corner from Bayless's home. Koberger's major, criminology. He's always been kind of fascinated with, with kind of how the, how the brain works and uh, how people think and why they do what they do. And so my senior year, I ended up in a biology class, which is where I met and interacted with uh, Brian Koberger. What were your first impressions of the guy? Uh, Brian seemed normal enough. But that opinion did not last for Bernard James, a DeSales film student in 2018 when he attended a class with Koberger. One of the big parts of that biology class that we were in, we had a group project uh, as a part of our final grade. With four DeSales classmates on the project, Koberger was chosen as team leader. Not surprising for the student DeSales professor Michelle Bolger called brilliant and one of the best students ever, according to an article in the Daily Mail. Dr. Bolger declined to comment to King 5. But to some classmates at the Christian University, Koberger seemed more like a know-it-all. The way that he came across in his speech, uh, you know, kind of person who has to use big words, you know, the one always raising his hand in class. And what happened then towards the end of this whole thing? We're approaching the due date and I was feeling like I was left out to dry. Bernard James says Koberger completed the class project without including him, resulting in a failed class in Bernard's final year at DeSales. He confronted Koberger in the university library. I remember him being very straight-faced, very like almost emotionless with this. He kind of like a, a small smile on his face. Like there's more to him than it seems. Very intense stare. I remember that. I'll never forget that. <laughs> Um, looking right into my soul almost, you know, as we were having this back and forth. Um, yeah, manipulative, uh, cold. Was he witnessing an odd personality trait or something more? After Koberger's arrest, Bernard can't be sure. I mean, it's not every day you expect to come into contact with someone who's accused of something like that, you know, but I see it in some ways, you know, I see the, the calculated uh, side of him. We're talking about four vicious stabbings here. Yeah. Could your friend have done this? I, don't know, I, I, ho I hope he didn't do it. You know, I, I'm a big believer in innocent until proven guilty. So I, I hope someone I know didn't do that, you know. Here in Pennsylvania, we've been unable to reach anyone from Koberger's family. A public defender here who represented him during extradition proceedings has said that Koberger looks forward to being exonerated in Idaho. The question comes from Joan. She asks, it's become known in the Koberger case that the police went through the trash to get DNA evidence. Do the police need a warrant to do that? Let's dive in. Our sources to verify this are the U.S. Constitution, the 1988 Supreme Court case California v. Greenwood, and Wayne Unger, a visiting professor of law at Gonzaga University. Here I teach constitutional law and data privacy law, uh, as well as the First Amendment. My research covers the Fourth Amendment, which is relevant to this particular question that you bring. Viewer Jones' question comes from the details in the Koberger case laid out in the probable cause affidavit that police in Pennsylvania searched through the trash can outside of Koberger's parents' home, where they say they obtained DNA evidence used to link him to the crime scene in Moscow. When do police or investigators need a warrant to search through your trash? The Supreme Court has ruled in a case called California v. Greenwood back in 1988 that a warrant is not required at all to search through somebody's trash, assuming that that trash has been like put out for uh, for pickup. 
The Fourth Amendment protects people from unreasonable search and seizure by the government, in this case the police. In California v. Greenwood, the Supreme Court determined the trash left for pickup outside your home isn't protected by the Fourth Amendment. But police must also consider what their state constitution says on the matter. Pennsylvania and Idaho, um, kind of the two kind of states involved in this particular case, uh, they do not have anything above and beyond the Supreme Court's consideration of no warrant. So in other words, law enforcement in Pennsylvania and Idaho can generally search your trash so long as it, again, it's been put outside. The location is key here. If your trash is left for pickup outside your home, police generally don't need a warrant. If your trash is inside your home or garage, then police do need a warrant. That brings us back to the Koberger case. Law enforcement in this particular case in Pennsylvania acted lawfully and constitutionally uh, when it collected the DNA from uh, the parents' trash can. So we can verify that police do not need a warrant to search your trash so long as it's outside your home, unless the state constitution where that search takes place states otherwise. If you have something you'd like me to verify, send me an email at verify at creme.com. Well, this meeting lasted nearly six hours. In the end, council members told developers to come back on February 21st. And in the meantime, work with neighborhoods and city planners to address some of these concerns that have been raised for several months now. Developers say Cortair would not only bring much needed housing to the area, the $2.5 billion investment would create over 900 new jobs, two new schools, and generate an estimated $4.4 million in sales and property tax revenue for the city each year. But many people who live near the proposed site say they'll be the ones paying the price. Homeowners are worried about traffic, property values, and how this development will impact their quiet neighborhood where people still ride horses on the street. I have been kind of heartbroken as I've been talking with some of my neighbors and heard them say that they're glad that they're pretty sure they're going to be dead before they experience most of the fallout that they expect from this decision. It will erase the Indian Meadows neighborhood. If you vote for the annexation, you're voting against Coeur d'Alene citizens you store to serve. This needs to be something that's very thoughtful, well thought out, the roads, the traffic, because we live there. So developers were told to come back to City Council two weeks from now with solutions to some of these concerns. One idea floated tonight, restricting access to the east of the development to keep the estimated 10,000 extra cars out of that existing neighborhood. We'll continue to follow this story as it develops. In Coeur d'Alene tonight, Kyle Simchuk, Krem2 News. This is Milo, and just like any dog, he likes to obey orders, play with people, and sometimes even make a little mess. But this dog just saved someone's life. Well, let's be careful. Look, Last Tuesday started out routine for Chris Totter and his wife, Stephanie. Oh, I was perfectly fine. I went uh, to a testing center, passed my real estate uh, broker's exam. Chris opened the door to let his dogs play outside. Good boy, good boy, my love. Less than an hour later, Stephanie was at work and her neighbor texted an audio message of Milo barking. That bark was alerting people that something was wrong. But I could kind of hear the distress in Milo's. It, it was, yeah, it, it scared me. Stephanie so, tried to get a hold of Chris. Like I said, I called him a half a dozen times and just nothing. And so I kind of got, you know, that airy feeling. And She rushed home. Milo, like I said, circled uh, my car, led me right up here to the bed. Uh, Chris was here laying on the bed. If I hadn't gotten here by... By the time that I did, it would have been probably four more hours that Chris would have been unconscious. Chris has diabetes. He says doctors oh think goodness. he collapsed because of high blood sugar. He was in the hospital for almost two days. Want to shake on it? He sat down on the bed, and the next thing I knew, I woke up at uh, 1 a.m. on Thursday morning with a uh, room full of strangers. So, oh, if like their it. dog didn't alert their neighbor, Chris says he might not even be alive right now. Oh, extremely grateful. You know, I know I'm here because Milo did what he did. Love him even more. He's a good boy. And just a week later, he is already feeling much better. Stephanie and Chris say they'll forever be grateful for what Milo did. And I'm told that Milo's getting some extra special treats. In Spokane, Nathan Hun, Krem2 News. Last month, a majority of Liberty Lake City Council voted to look at amending city law. I'm not really sure as I think about this, 
who we would say that the library board is accountable to. To answer that very question, most city council members want some authority over the board. That proposed change would mean Liberty Lake City Council would have more oversight over the library board's decision making. And it all comes down to five little words. To add the phrase, as approved by city council. Right now, city administrator Mark McAvoy says city council has oversight over the library's budgets. The proposed amendment to city ordinance would give council the final say over changes to the library board's policies. We're talking about use of space, we're talking about hours, we're talking about um, access to certain uh, places uh, in the library, we're talking about uh, collections. McAvoy says discussions over getting council more involved in library policy started last summer. Banning books will not be the end of whatever crusade you are on. Last May, council voted to keep the book Gender Queer on the shelves after a parent complained about its graphic illustrations. I asked McAvoy if changing city code would give council more power to approve or ban books. So the policy governing collection management isn't focused on individual books or pieces of library material. Council members who called for the change say it's a way to give the people more power to appeal. It's uh, another form of checks and balances. The mayor, who doesn't have a vote, and other members of the city council question whether their input is necessary. It's not broken. Why are we trying to fix it? Krem 2 wasn't able to speak with any council members or members of the library board. The possible change will be up for another discussion later this month. So the next step would not be to vote on a change. And will be up for public input before any decisions are made. <laughs> Jenna Mowdy, Crem 2 News. I confirmed this afternoon Pullman police are investigating an attempted abduction of a PhD international student at Washington State University. Now that student is OK, but police are still searching for that suspect. Meantime, students who live near where this incident happened are feeling uneasy. Recent events on the Palouse over the last few months have understandably put the Pullman community on edge. And now there's even more concern after someone tried to force their way into a WSU student's apartment Friday night. Oh my gosh, that's scary because it's like right here where I'm living at. Selena Salou lives a few doors down from where the incident happened. She learned about the attempted abduction in a group chat. Now it's like you have to look where you're going and watching like who's like out and stuff because it's like you can't really trust anyone now. The rest of the community learned about what happened after the victim posted about it online. According to that post, after walking home Friday night, the PhD student noticed a black car parked outside her apartment. She says it was running and the trunk was left open. She got inside the apartment, but when she went to close the door, a man grabbed the door handle and tried forcing himself inside. The Post says she had to use her full body weight to close and lock the door. She reported this to police shortly after. And then, out of fear, she left Pullman as soon as she could. We need the community's help. Commander Aaron Brashears says officers arrived on scene within minutes and made extra patrols that night, but they did not find the man or the black car. He says the man is described as approximately five foot five and was seen wearing a green sweatshirt. Police are also searching for a black sedan, possibly a Nissan Altima with faded black paint and no license plates. Right now, officers are investigating all possible leads, talking to neighbors and asking the community to share any information that may be helpful to the investigation. If there is a logical explanation for the circumstances, I would ask that the person responsible give us a call and explain if there is a logical explanation. It's scary to just think about because it's like I can't even like walk out without like being like paranoid, like who's watching me and stuff or like what if this happens to me? In the meantime, Selena plans to be extra cautious and keep her head on a swivel.
Now, I have spoken with that PhD student who reported this incident. She says she's glad to be okay and feeling very lucky. Now, in the meantime, Pullman police have also posted on Facebook. They are also investigating a suspicious person who was seen looking into homes around College Hill. Now, to be clear, they do not believe this is related to the attempted abduction incident, but we will continue to keep tracking this story as it develops. Reporting in Pullman, Amanda Rowley, Krem 2 News. Well, Spokane police say Avondre Graham brutally attacked a woman near the Parkade in downtown Spokane. Now, we learned from court documents that attack happened in the southeast area of the Parkade. Then, based on witness accounts and surveillance videos police collected, they say the suspect took off running toward Howard Street through this alley behind the Parkade. An hour later, the police made an arrest. This convicted murderer has a history of attacking women in Spokane. After serving more than 10 years in prison for murdering and attacking two different women in 2012, Spokane police say Avondre Graham attacked another woman just last month. According to court documents, the woman told police as she passed the suspect on Stevens Street, he made a vulgar sexual comment. She says he abruptly knocked her to the ground, and then the suspect struck and kicked her several times until witnesses intervened. The woman told police she remembered thinking, this person is going to kill me and I need to fight for my life. Investigators identified the suspect through multiple surveillance cameras in the area. They determined he ran away through this alley. An hour after the attack, police found Graham on the Monroe Street Bridge. Officers say he resisted arrest and threatened to take their guns and kill them. He is now in Spokane County Jail and charged with assault and resisting arrest. Graham confirmed he is the person seen on video running through the alley, but he claims he was running to catch the bus, denying any involvement in the attack. At the time of his arrest, the Department of Corrections says Graham was still under supervision, which was scheduled to end in November next year. In fact, court documents say about 25 minutes after the attack, Graham met with his probation officer. She told investigators the meeting was short and she noticed he was hacking and coughing a lot while using his inhaler. Now, court documents say the woman does not know the suspect and she was visiting Spokane from out of town for work. Now, Graham is expected to enter a guilty or not guilty plea in court next week. Amanda Rowley, Crime 2 News. Well, the Spokane City Hall we know today is in the former Montgomery Ward building. City government moved in there back in the 80s. Today, that building provides more than enough room. City Council budget manager Matt Boston estimates 40% of the building space isn't being used. City Hall is being utilized at 60% of its current capacity. That is considering that um, every uh, individual that is here, whether they be on a hybrid uh, schedule or they be on a full-time schedule, is counted as a desk at that point in time. Um, so that number could be much smaller. The city entered a purchase option agreement to buy the Primera building on East Sprague. If that deal goes through, it'll likely become a new municipal justice center. However, some council members want to know if there's also enough space there to relocate City Hall or at least some city departments. We reached out to the mayor's office and communications director Brian Connington says the mayor would not support moving City Hall out of downtown Spokane, but is open to other properties downtown. Now, another option is leasing out one or two floors at City Hall to private businesses. Right now, there is no clear timeline on a decision. A company has been hired to look at the city's entire real estate portfolio. In the studio, Kyle Simchuk, Krem 2 News. As Kootenai Homeshare is officially online as of this morning, so now anyone can log into the website here and put their applications in under the Applications tab. Anyone who's interested in providing housing or looking for housing. Kootenai Homeshare is a local branch of a national program that helps match people who are looking for housing who, with people who have extra room. And a program like this is the first in the state of Idaho. It's been a year and a half in the making, and Coeur d'Alene City Council member Kiki Miller says there's already providers and home seekers in the queue ready to apply. These are people that our community needs, local workers that need um, to live where they work. So that need for housing is the middle piece of, of, of what our community needs to thrive. 
She says this interest has really shown how many people in our area are looking for housing. It's a simple process. You can go to homesharekc.com to fill out an application. Then everyone who applies, whether you're providing housing or looking for housing, has to go through a background check. Once that background check is done, ambassadors will start doing interviews and making matches. And once there's a match, there's a two-week trial period. And if it works, then that's that. And Kiki Miller says she's expecting the program to have some of its first matches at the end of this month. In the newsroom, Nicole Hernandez, Crem 2 News. This story caught a lot of attention last week when the Washington State GOP's Twitter account posted this, encouraging constituents to oppose two bills, including House Bill 1220. That bill would make voting mandatory for registered voters in Washington. The tweet also suggests people who don't vote would be tossed in jail. But is that the case? Let's verify. Our sources are the bill itself, its author, State Representative Charlotte Mena, and State Senator Mike Padden. But what we're hoping to do is have a conversation about how we can put greater responsibility on the state to register folks and encourage them to vote. Representative Mena says the bill aims to encourage more people, namely historically disenfranchised communities, to participate in their government. And she points out voters who don't want to fill out a ballot would have an option. While this bill would say that you need to vote, there would also be an option on the ballot to say none of the above and return a blank ballot. So we're not trying to to mandate that anyone vote or, or vote a certain way or anything like that. We just we want to ensure that there's greater participation from folks. Mena admits that she doesn't expect the bill to pass this year, but she thinks it's important to at least start the conversation. I know in my district, folks are in general opposed to this. State Senator Mike Patton says he supports more people participating in elections, but he does not believe this is the right way to go about it. I think people should have the right to vote or not vote. And I certainly encourage them to vote and study the candidates and vote their values. But uh, this proposal, which is unique, no other state has it, I, I think is something you'd see in a totalitarian country rather than the United States. But back to the claim that not voting would land you in jail. The bill's author says that is not the case. But I think importantly, it doesn't include any penalties or enforcement. So we can verify, no, as written, House Bill 1220 would not lead to penalties, including jail time for registered voters who don't vote. If you have something you'd like me to verify, send me an email at verify at creme.com. Large up. For 60 years, Here you are, sir. anyone passing third in division yeah, have yeah. has seen this. Dick's Hamburgers, staple of Spokane. Jamie McBride has been general manager of Dick's for two years. I've been here 30 years. Over the years, she's learned their prices stand out in Spokane. Volume, it's about volume here more than just trying to gouge the customers. Even their best seller is cheap. The Whammy is our most popular burger. It's $4.35. Really? We do our best to keep our prices affordable. But as for the rest of Spokane... It has gotten crazy expensive. Can't do it anymore, hardly. Rob Robson used to go out with his family all the time. Probably twice a week. But with the increasing prices now... Maybe twice a month. Eating out in general is just more expensive than it used to be. It's hard to get out for under $75. We pulled burger prices from the top 15 sit-down burger joints in the city, according to Yelp. The most expensive place to get a burger on the list? Durkin's Famous Double at $19. And on average, the cheapest burger comes from Mary Lou's Milk Bottle. Their burgers average just $11.66. After comparing more than 100 prices, a burger will cost you, on average, $16.26 here in Spokane. It's even getting difficult for Dick's to keep their promise of low prices. Right now, the cost of every product that we get in here is going up. That inflation is hitting the customers' wallets. We don't go out as much as we used to. But Sherry Battle says it's more than just inflation affecting Spokane's prices. Well, with Kindle Yards and that sort of things coming, the places have just got more yuppie, kind of is what I always tell my daughter. <laughs> and she laughs at me. I'm like, oh, yeah, things have gotten kind of yuppie here. Sherry says upscale restaurants are replacing places like Rocky Rococo's and Azar's. That's why I'm at Dick's. But Dick's <laughs> is planning on keeping the cheap eats around as long as possible. It can feel like inflation is impacting the cost of food at the grocery store more and more each day. Agricultural specialists tell me inflation is impacting all aspects of the business, from how much they can spend on feed 
to how much they can price their final product at. Whether you're a producer or consumer, there's no escaping inflation. Everything's increasing in price. Producers say they're fighting rising costs of feed, hay, gas, and other farming essentials. We're guessing that's a 20% increase in cost for most items. Agricultural researchers say inflation is dominating all aspects of the food industry, from beginning to end. We're also seeing that some of our raw products and the cost of production are going up. You know, what we feed the animals is going up. Those increases are changing how producers are selling their products. Dean Pike with Idaho Livestock doesn't sell your average cut of meat at the grocery store. When we uh, harvest these cattle, we're able to let them hang in the locker a lot longer, which causes the beef to be a lot tender and, and just a lot better tasting. And even his business is adapting to market pressures. So what we've all uh, been working on is, is an innovative marketing program where we might uh, sell these people this meat and get a down payment on it and take a payment so that they're able to afford it o over a period of time. Researchers say while this may be a tricky time to buy food and the things we need, they're hopeful costs will come down as inflation cycles through. Despite the challenges inflation may be putting on our grocery shopping, organizers here at the Agricultural Expo tell me producers are doing all they can to put out the best quality products and price it appropriately. In Spokane, Janelle Finch, Creme 2 News. I'm here at Eagles Ice Arena, which is the only indoor ice rink in Spokane, but I'm told that another one could be coming in the future. If you want to ice skate indoors, your only option is to go to Eagles Ice Arena. Susanna Hall, the arena skating director, says it's shocking there's not more ice rinks. It is baffling, though, that we are in a cold climate and there is not a ton of awareness of the sport. In planning for its tourism strategy, the city of Spokane Valley is proposing a new indoor ice rink. Right now, it's just a preliminary concept. The city is in its early stages of exploring whether there is enough demand to support a new indoor ice rink. A third-party consulting firm told City Council it would attract people to the area. If ice rinks aren't readily available in the greater area and it's a asset that can be leveraged for a positive economic impact, then it's going to be in consideration. The consulting firm told the city a two-sheet indoor ice rink could cost about $50 million. There is also no location in mind since the proposal for the ice rink is in its preliminary phase. Anytime um, you start to get serious about whether you're going to include something in your strategy and implement it, you need to look at where the funding is going to come from, and that hasn't been identified yet. As for Susanna, she says that she hopes the project gets approved sooner than later. We love exposure to the sport. And there's opportunity for growth and advancement, and we encourage having more opportunities for athletes of all ages and disciplines to be able to grow their passion for the sport. The ice rink is one of the first proposed attractions for the city's tourism strategy. The strategy will also consider other sports venues and attractions. Officials at Spokane Valley tell me there's not yet a timeline for a new ice rink, but for avid skiers, they can come right here to Eagles Ice Arena. In Spokane, Nathan Hyun, Krem 2 News. All righty, I have your fried green tomatoes. My pleasure, enjoy. To be in the top 100, awesome. To be in the top 50, that's you know coming in at number 43. I believe we are that great. I know we are that great, but to see it in black and white all over the news is uh, such a humbling gift that we don't take lightly. I'm Rhiannon Keen, a chef and co-owner with uh, Jason Keen here at Izzy's. We've been open since September 16th, 2020. We found out we were nominated and going to be on the list maybe two weeks before Christmas. I didn't really think it was real. <laughs> at first, I'm reading my email, you're tired, and you think, oh, this can't be a thing. And so uh, a few hours later, I was like, I think it's a thing. And so then we just kind of waited. Um, and so we didn't know the actual placement until last Wednesday when they announced the list and it was really cool. So these are our fried green tomatoes. About 95% of my menu is gluten free. Being celiac, it's something that I just had to learn how to cook that way so that I could eat. And so the idea that serving that 
part of the community has really become a niche of ours for those that need it and those that don't, don't know it's gluten-free. Sometimes they ask, well, how's the gluten-free version? Like, that is the gluten-free version, which makes me really proud as a chef to be able to say, I want to make you something that's delicious, no matter the science of how I have to maneuver it to get it to be what I want it to be. The day that that happened, you know, we're fixing, our heater had gone down, and it's like, it's just the restaurant business. You win an award one moment, and you're on your hands and knees scrubbing something the next. So, you know, it keeps you humble, that's for sure. So we're very thankful. Uh, but we, just, we have a lot of work to do, so we're just back at work. Thank you for joining us here on Creme 2 Plus for a look at some of the biggest news stories in the past week in Spokane and the rest of the Inland Northwest. For the most up-to-date news throughout the weekend, you can watch our very latest newscast right here on Creme 2 Plus. Just look for them in the bottom navigation menu. I'm Tim Pham. Thanks for watching.